afternoon everyone. My name is Homer Benaflor and today I will discuss two of the instructional design models, particularly Assure model and Dig and Carry model. Let's first discuss Assure model. What is Assure model? Assure model was developed by Heinrich and Molena. In 1999, it is an instructional design used by teachers to develop lesson plans and they are aiming to integrate or use technology and media in their lessons. Take note that Assure model is very effective especially when you are using media in your lesson. An instructional design model has the goal of producing effective teaching and learning. Of course, a sure model is a process that was modified to be used by teachers, of course, in a regular classroom. A sure model incorporates Robert Gagne's events of instruction to assure effective use of media in instruction. Now you may wonder, what are Robert Gagne's events of instruction? Robert Gagne's events of instruction states that learners must actively participate in the class discussion. Learners must interact not only with their peers or classmates, but they must also interact with their learning environment and with their teachers. Thus, a sure model is modeled to Robert Gagne's events of instruction. A sure model is an acronym that is divided into six phrases. Let's first discuss A. A stands for Analyze learners. Teachers like us must always analyze the attributes of the learners. When we say attributes, it refers to the general characteristics of the learners. Their age, their gender, their culture. Also, attributes refers to the academic levels their learning skills, competencies, styles, or even interests. Why? Okay. Why must teacher know their attributes? Those attributes will help the teachers to think or choose the correct decision that will be aligned to the other steps in a sure model. When you determine the attributes, it will guide the teachers in choosing the specific strategies and resources to be used. Next one is the sec first S. S stands for State Standards and Objectives. Of course, we are quite familiar with objectives. So the teacher first must always state what do you want or what do you want your students to know at the end or by the end of the lesson? Okay, don't forget that learning outcomes is very important. Of course, uh, you may use the Bloom's taxonomy in your objectives and standards. The second S refers to select strategies, technology, media, and the materials. Okay. Don't forget that instructional materials, methods, media cannot be overlooked. Okay. The materials and the media should be appropriate to the learning topic, to the subject, or to the topic that you are aiming to teach to the students. Once you select your teaching strategy, it is time to figure out what is the correct, the appropriate technology to be used okay, to support your teaching. However, don't rely too much 
be your materials. Don't forget that teachers are still the most essential ingredients in the learning of the students. Technology, media, materials are just tools. Okay? Tools are just tools. They are only used to guide you or to help you in teaching. But teachers okay, must be or must always be the most essential part of the learning process or the teaching process of the Next one is U. Okay, U stands for Utilize Technology, Media, and Materials. But before you utilize, teachers must always preview okay, the use of media and materials. Okay, we never know if the material will work on your lesson proper. Okay, so we must always prepare or preview the use of technology, media, and materials. In this stage, utilize also refers to the environment, the learning environment. Is the learning environment appropriate? To the students, are there unnecessary signs that may hinder or distract the student from learning? So the teacher must know what are the appropriate materials or environment for the students to learn or to for them to effectively learn your topic. Okay, that is you utilize technology, media, and materials. Next one is R, require learner participation. As a teacher, you must engage the students to your class discussion. Okay, don't forget that requiring students to participate will not only engage them in the class, but also you are helping them to remember what they are learning okay learner participation helps in their retention to the topic that you had taught okay how can you do that you can use class discussions hands-on activities questioning or other teaching strategies that will help you engage learner into participating into participating the last part is E, evaluate and revise. This sometimes this stage is skipped or forgot by the teachers. However, don't forget that it is one of the most important piece of a sure model. Try to evaluate if you already if you already reached your objectives okay don't forget that reteaching is not a negative thing okay it makes you a great teacher what because a great teacher recognizes that the learners or some of the learners didn't meet your learning objectives and as a great teacher you must be aware to that kind of problem or yes problem and try to revise what is the what is a better strategy to teach the lesson to them and that concludes the assure model the second type or the second instructional design is the leak and carry model also known as systems approach model why? Okay. Why is it systems approach model? The can carry model focuses on the delivery of the content. Okay. It focuses on the delivery of content. As the name suggests, it was developed by Walter Dick and Lou and James Carey of Florida. The can carry model is divided into Ten components compared to a sure model this model is divided into 10 components okay, let's discuss the first component the stage one instructional goals instructional goals 
Okay? As a teacher, you must describe what the learners are expected to perform at the end of the instruction. Remember, describe what learners should learn and not what they are going to do. Again, learners, describe what learners should learn in the topic and not what they are going to do during the topic. Okay, that is instructional goals. The stage two refers to instructional analysis, the pink box at the top part. Instructional analysis, as a teacher, we must examine or identify the exact performance gap between the present performance and the desired performance. What is that gap? Okay, that gap refers to the step-by-step -step of what learners are doing when they are performing the goal, the instructional goal. That is the performance gap. In addition, a teacher must determine what are the skills, the knowledge required by the students okay, to reach your instructional goals. The third stage is the entry behaviors and learner characteristics. So again, the teacher must know the general characteristics of the learners. Characteristics again refers to the attitude, preference, skills, experience, or even motivation of the learners. Okay, why you should know them? Okay, because it will help you to relate the skills to the topic that you will teach. Remember, the general characteristics of the learners must be detailed. Okay, so you can know this exact starting point where to teach okay, and not to spend a lot of time to unnecessary topics to be taught. Their goal here is to start the learning process at the level where they already understand. So again, the general characteristics must be detailed. Stage 4 refers to performance objectives. It consists of the description of the task or skills to be learned. Okay, what are the standards? There are criteria. It is also, or it must be detailed. Okay? You should specify what will the learners be able to do with the skills that they will learn. Okay? What is the use of the skills that they will learn? That is the performance objective. Again, it must be detailed. Stage 5 refers to criterion reference test items. When you are planning to create your uh, lesson plan, remember to, of course, create the test that is suitable for the students. The test that will reflect what you are hoping to teach to the students. Okay? Why? It is to ensure the learners meet the necessary prerequisites. To perform the new skills that they will learn. And also, it will help the students to understand what they have and what they haven't mastered yet. What they have and they haven't mastered yet. Stage 6 refers to instructional strategy or the lesson plan. As you may wonder, from stage 1 to stage 6, you are not yet teaching. You are still preparing for your lesson. Okay, again, lesson plan is our framework. Okay, it's one of the most important part of being a teacher. Okay, stage 6, the lesson plan should demonstrate okay, or should show what you want them to learn. What you want them to learn. What are the activities, the assessment, strategies that they, you will use for your teaching? 
stage 7 is the instructional materials that will show or that will help you to teach your students. Okay, remember, instructional materials should be accurate or appropriate to your lesson. Stage 8 refers to, ref, refers to the formative evaluation. Stage 8 is how or stage 8 is the end of your topic. Okay, you already taught the topic, the lesson that you will discuss. In this part, you will evaluate how the lesson went. Is it successful? Okay. Then, after evaluating, you should collect the data to reflect how you will improve your instruction. Stage 9 okay, is the summative evaluation. Judge the worthiness of the entire program. Did it work well? Did you reach your objective? Did it work as intended? If it's not, this will go to stage 10, revised instruction. Okay? Try to examine the validity of your instructional analysis, of your objective, assessment instrument, strategies, instruction. Is it helpful? Is it worth it? Is it successful? If not, try to revise it in stage number 10. Okay, and that concludes the dish and carry model and of course the assure model. Thank you very much. Good day everyone. Today I am going to discuss about Kemp's instructional model and Gudnick's nine events of instruction. Let me start with Kemp's instructional model. So what is Kemp's instructional model? The Kemp instructional design model is an instructional design method that grows from a number of disciplines and approaches to instructional design. It's also known as the Morrison, Ross, and Kemp model. This instructional design framework outlines nine circular, nonlinear stages. So the emphasis of this model, which is the interdependency, interdependencies of each of the steps in the process with the belief that instructional design is a continuous cycle with revision being an ongoing process to improve and adjust as needed. That is why it is unique in its nonlinear structure and interrelated nature of those main components allowing for flexibility. These stages can be addressed simultaneously, individually, or in some cases, not at all. So as I said, unlike other instructional design models, like the Dick and Perry model, the Kemp design model is circular rather than linear. The Kemp model approaches instruction and design from the perspective of the learner. So the overall needs, goals, priorities, and constraints of the learner are considered to determine the instructional solutions. Nine components of Kemp's model. So the following nine elements are the basic components that make up the Kemp design process. They are interdependent and are presented in, in an oval shape to reflect the flexibility of the process and that there is no specific order in completing the process. So the first element is instructional problems. Determine the specific goals and also identify potential instructional issues. So the focus of this element is defining the learning outcomes for the course. This includes what the student needs to learn or the skills they need to acquire for they need to acquire at the end of the course. Second is learners' characteristics. Explore the characteristics and needs of learners. Identify characteristics that will influence and guide the planning process. So this is where the teachers 
have to identify the characteristics and needs of the learners that should be taken into account. Third is task analysis. One of the most important stages of the design process is this stage to understand what knowledge and procedures you need to include in the instruction to help the learner master the learning objectives. It is a very important element because it helps the designer to begin thinking about the overall content of the course in relation to the characteristics of the learner. Next is instructional objectives. Identify the instructional and learning objectives. Specify exactly what the learner must learn and master. The objectives offer a sort of map for designing the instruction. So this is where the instructors define the instructional objectives of the course and the learning outcome. Fifth is content sequencing. Arrange content in a logical order for effective learning. So ensuring the order in which the information is presented plays an important role in helping the learners understand and take in the information efficiently. Also, make sure that the content for each component of instruction is sequentially and logically presented. Sixth is instructional strategies. Design instructional strategies to enable learners to master the content and achieve the learning outcomes. So this is considered as the creative step. This stage involves designing creative, designing creative and innovative strategies to present the information. And it helps learners to reach stated learning objectives. Next is designing the message. Plan the instructional message and the appropriate mode of delivery. So this is where the teachers or instructors plan and design the instructional message and decide how it is to be conveyed to the students. Eight is instructional delivery. Design and or select resources and materials to support instructional activities. And last is evaluation instruments. Develop evaluation instruments that will be used to assess and evaluate learners' mastery of the learning. So basically, this is where uh, the teachers will evaluate the performance of their students. The uses of CAMP's model. The comprehensive nature of the CAMP design model make it an appropriate tool for designing large online instructional modules, but too unwieldy for developing short single purpose lessons. So the CAMP model is ideal for large instructional design projects where there will be a number of team members contributing to the process. Now let's go to Gagni's nine events of instruction. So Robert Gagni proposed a series of events which follow a systematic instructional design process that share the behaviors approach to learning with a focus on the outcomes or behaviors of instruction. Or training. Gagni's instructional theory tends to side with behavioristic principles or teacher centered approach. And he focuses on outcomes, behaviors that result from instruction. He believes that the results of learning are measurable through testing and that drill, practice, and immediate feedback are effective. So, what is Gagnis Nine Events of Instruction. It provides a framework for an effective learning process. Each step addresses a form of communication that supports the learning process. When each step is completed, learners are much more likely to be engaged and retain the information or skills that they are being taught. 
So the first event is gaining attention. Ensure the learners are ready to learn and participate in activities by presenting a stimulus to gain their attention. So, for example, uh, the teachers can stimulate the students with novelty, uncertainty, and surprise. They can also pose thought-provoking questions to the students or ask them to pose questions to be answered by their peers. Second event is inform learners of the objectives. Inform students of the objectives or outcomes to help them understand what they are to learn during the course. Provide objectives before instruction begins. So, uh, the teacher can, this is where the teacher describes the required performance or describe, or describe the criteria for standard performance to the students. Next is stimulate recall of prior learning. Help students make sense of new information by relating it to something they already know or something they have already experienced. So, teachers can ask students questions about previous experiences or ask them about their understanding of previous concepts. Part is presenting the content. Use strategies to present and cue lesson content to provide more effective, efficient instruction. Organize and chunk content in a meaningful way. Provide explanations after demonstrations. Now, for example, the teacher can present multiple versions of the same content through video demonstration, lecture, podcast, group work, or use a variety of media to address different learning preferences. Tip is provide learning guidance. Advise students of strategies to aid them in learning content and of resources available. The teachers can provide instructional support if needed to the students. Uh, the teachers can also model varied learning strategies, use examples and non-examples, or provide case studies analogies, visual images, and metaphors. Elicit performance or practice. Activate student processing to help them internalize new skills and knowledge and to confirm correct understanding of these concepts. The instructor can el elicit student activities like asking them deep learning questions, Next is providing feedback. Provide immediate feedback of students' performance to assess and facilitate learning. There are many types of feedbacks and some of those are confirmatory feedback which the teacher informs the student they did what he or she was supposed to do. There's also the corrective and remedial feedback. Informs the student the accuracy of their performance or response. Uh, there's, and also, there's the analytical feedback, which provides the students with suggestions, recommendations, and information for them to correct their performance. Next is assess performance. In order to evaluate the effectiveness of the instructional event, you must test to see if the expected learning outcomes have been achieved. Performance should be based on previously stated objectives. So to test the learning outcomes, the teacher can, for example, conduct a post-test to check for mastery of content or skills. Or the teacher can insert questions throughout the instruction or throughout the class through oral questioning or quizzes. And last of the nine events is enhanced retention and transfer to the job. To help learners develop expertise, they must internalize new knowledge. So, teachers can help students internalize new knowledge by paraphrasing content, use metaphors, generate examples, or create concept maps or outlines. Uses of Gagne's Nine Events of Instruction Gagni's nine events of instruction helps educators, trainers, and instructional designers structure their training sessions. 
it can help build the framework with which to prepare and deliver instructional content. The steps essentially give designers an outline or prototype to use prior to performing or training activities. And that is where my report ends. Thank you for listening and again, have a good day. Okay, so good morning everyone. I am the one to present to you the YouTube Live as one of the tools in teaching online. So before we start, I would like to introduce myself first. I am Jessica Vitaro, your presenter for today. So <clears throat> let us define first what is YouTube Live. So when we say YouTube Live, it is an online streaming tool simultaneously recorded and broadcast in real time. So it may be done pre-recorded or live. It includes various topics from social media to video games to professional sports, depending on the interests and the preferences of the creator. Okay, so let us have first the uses of YouTube Live. So what are the uses of YouTube Live? First, when it comes to entertainment, we can also use YouTube Live. Why? When it, uh, when it comes to online games, you can do live streaming just like one of the famous gamers known today who is PewDiePie. You can also live stream theaters, movies, and the likes. You can also live stream or if you are a celebrity, you can conduct concert online too. And also live streaming sports, just like basketball, softball, and the likes. Okay, another use of YouTube Live is for business. Instead of face, um, doing face-to-face -face meeting, you can have conference using YouTube Live. You can also interact with your colleagues using meeting, uh, YouTube Live. Another is for education. So you can conduct lessons using YouTube Live, recorded or not. So that is what we call asynchronous and asynchronous. You can interact with them live or you can just send the videos to them for them to watch and ask for their responses. Okay, so how do we use or how do we operate a live streaming using YouTube? So first, okay, you need to access your YouTube Live dashboard. So if you do not have your YouTube account yet, you have to go and get, uh, make your account and get started here. So you're going to have to input your um, phone number because you are asked to verify your account using it. So if you're already done with the verification, you already have your YouTube account, you can now start. Next thing is you have to go to live streaming and fill up the necessary information needed for you to start streaming online. Then review the live streaming list, wherein you can see the other options and the other information that you have to input for you to make a live stream good. So it includes set up and setting up your encoding software. Usually, uh, we use OBS or Open Broadcast soft uh, software. Another is add streaming info, optional features and also going live okay so another thing that you have to input are the basic information or is the basic information so that includes the title of your video presentation and also the description what would be your video all about and you have to schedule when you're going to stream that online and also the category, what would be the category of your video? Is it education? Is it 
um, sports, science, politics, it depends on you. So after that, you're going to input your privacy option. So you have the unlisted, the public, and the private. So usually if you're a teacher, you're going to choose the unlisted one because you're just uh, just going to choose to whom are you going to send the link. You're not going to post it publicly because it is not intended for public to see. Okay, so the next thing is the st uh, stream options. So there you will see enabling DVR and also the stream optimizations. You just choose optimize for interaction with low latency for you to interact with the audience or the viewers using the chat room okay then okay you can click on the advanced settings in the bottom right corner to get the additional settings for your youtube live event all on one screen so everything that you have put all the information that you have put will be seen here. Okay, so after that, you're going to choose your input sources. So you're going to incorporate your YouTube Live or your video to an OBS or to OBS. So you're going to choose your, your webcam input for video capture your desktop for display capture or window capture and audio input capture okay so after that you're going to set up your encoding software so from your youtube account you're going to input your input your server url and then your stream name key and then you're going to connect that or put that also on the OBS for them to be connected to each other. Then after that, this image is what you're going to see if you're going to live stream. So you can start uh, streaming by, cl by clicking the streaming button on the OBS. This will send what you see in open broadcast software directly to YouTube Live and start your live streaming there. Okay, so if you're already done with the video, you can stop streaming. Just click it on the OBS. And you can already upload it if you're done. So that is how you conduct live streaming YouTube using youtube so let us now go on with the advantages of using youtube live so the first one is the cost effective medium why because in terms of cost effectiveness youtube live must be considered because teacher no longer has to spend money to avail and use it as long as there is an internet connection so teachers will have to use her gadgets that uh, desktop mobile phone and with those gadgets she can already stream online another one is availability so resources to make youtube live are just hand away since mobile or personal computers could be both used depending on one's preference so a lot of us has uh, have our gadgets. So using our gadgets, we can already make our streaming. Another is connecting with your audience. So teachers are able to interact with the students and get their responses through chat room. So using YouTube Live, you can interact with your students even if in not uh, in not actual basis. Why? Because there is a chat room there wherein while they are viewing or they are watching, they can um, use the chat room to input their feedbacks on the videos. Another and the last one is it could be used as an avenue for money making. So this is for the vloggers who are trying to 
make money using YouTube. So YouTube holds the trump card that is easy monetization for live videos. So uh, through advertisement, you can, uh, the vloggers can, can, can gain, uh, can make money through the companies that are asking them to advertise their products and services. Okay, next, if we have the advantages, we also have the disadvantages of using YouTube Live. So one of which is the compromise on quality. So the viewer has to choose between real-time engagement and the view video quality, as a better quality video would require more resources. So because of that, there would be delay and buffering, and it would, it is, um something that youtube has no control of another one is difficulty in sharing difficulty in sharing is also an issue if one wishes to stream on other platforms without being disconnected from the stream especially if you're going to stream with a large community or a wide range of audience or viewers but when it comes to teaching you're just going to incorporate your a video using OBS and stream it online with a small number of students so it would not be a problem when it comes to teaching next is it isn't accessible without internet so students have no internet access with would find it hard to fit in this is in correlation as disadvantage for those who do not even have gadgets gadgets to use at home since not all students have capacity to buy their own gadgets so that would be a problem for those students who have no internet connection so teachers must think of other modalities in order for the students to continue or pursue education so one of the choices would be modular learning wherein the students will just receive modules from the school and they will answer it. Then after answering that, they will pass, uh, um, pass that or submit to the teacher to be checked. And then lastly is the lack of tools. So some features like picture-in-picture, multi-camera streaming, background audio playlist, and the likes that makes the video more appealing to the viewers are not yet provided by the YouTube if you choose to go live. So only if you choose to go live. If you're not going to stream live, maybe YouTube could provide that. Okay, so to sum it up, using different applications online to sustain one's goal might be risky and a challenge to some, especially for those who are not accustomed to using it. In teaching, however, we must always adapt to the situation as we are prompt to do what we can to employ learning to the best of what we can give, especially that we are teachers. We are known to be flexible. It includes exerting efforts and time to embrace the use of technology. This way, learning is possible. Nothing can hinder education from pushing through as long as there, there are alternative resources just like this app. So with that, I would like to, to say thank you for listening or viewing my video presentation. So these are the references that I have used. And thank you very much. Good day.